is going to be arranged as follows on Monday. I believe our final is from 8 to 10, just like our regular class time. And we're going to have it over chapters 1 through 8. And anything that you had on a regular test, you get on the final exam, meaning you get your cheat sheets, your solubility tables. If you want the model kits for things, then you know you have your model kits. And so uh, I would suggest also basically your tests are probably your best study guide in that questions that are on the test are likely to show up on the final, not in the exact same format necessarily, because I've got to be honest, I haven't rewritten the final in many, many years. Maybe I'll look at it this weekend, probably not. And so, you know, the question format might be slightly different and things like that, but the information is always the same. Because what I do is I cherry pick the key parts. I'm not trying to confuse you, I'm not trying to ask some random weird fact that you may or may not remember. It's going to be, you know, if chapter 8 is on reactions, guess what you're going to do? You're going to complete reactions. You're not going to, you know, I'm not going to give you, out of the 10 reactions, I'm not going to make 9 of them combination, or combination reactions, which we never, you know, you maybe had one of on the original test, right? The original test had mostly double displacement, single displacement, you know, a couple acid base, maybe a combustion, you know, it'll be about the same ratio of things too. I won't pick things that are just random. So I figure the best way to start studying for the test is sometimes I think maybe not starting at the beginning because I think some of the beginning material is pretty easy, but we will just start at the beginning because it just makes sense and that way I don't have to remember which chapters I've covered or not. So. The material on chapter one was mostly about the differences between solids, liquids, and gases. And I should point out that because some topics appear in multiple chapters, they might be tested in one spot and not another. Or, for instance, if since you know we talked about solids, liquids, and gases in chapter one, something that was useful in chapter 13 and 14 when we we're also talking about you know liquids and solids and some of the gases might creep into the chapter one question, meaning that the material shifts around just a little bit. You know, we covered titrations. Technically, it's supposed to be in chapter 15, but we covered it in chapter nine. It means on the final, it might be in chapter nine, it might be in chapter 15, which since they're both on the second half of the final probably doesn't make a big difference, but you know, those are things to kind of consider that, you know, we've seen some topics that we've come back and revisited multiple times. So, what's the big difference between solids, liquids, and gases? Yeah, we know that for uh, solids, the intermolecular forces are much less than the kinetic energy available to the mo molecules. That's why they're rigid, right? And so, you know, we can add that they're rigid. And then we also know that. Uh, they have definite shape and definite volume. And we can talk about the fact that they're not compressible, meaning those are all things that we even said in later chapters. But if you think back, it all started in chapter one for this. So if we kind of create some categories, we have our intermolecular forces, we have the particles, we have shape and volume, and we have um, compressibility. Meaning that's how we originally sort of defined them, although that intermolecular force category we didn't mention really in chapter one, right? But that idea of now that we know about intermolecular forces and we understand them means that that question could show up in chapter one or that question could show up in chapter 15 or 16. I might have even mentioned it and just said, hey, you know, we'll talk more detail about this, but just realize it's the attraction between stuff. Oh, hell oh, darn it. Just, um, it can be energy. We talked about it. It could be called energy of motion. It can also be simply the temperature, meaning we know that as temperature increases, the amount of energy available to the system increases. So all three of those terms are somewhat appropriate and can be used somewhat interchangeably. What about liquids? And so that means that there's some motion, right? So they're mobile, yet they cohere. 
I don't know how to spell that. That's close enough. Phonetic, if nothing else. Um, this is the one I always have to think hard. They have indefinite shape, but they have definite volume, meaning they can have any shape you want, but the volume that they have is very specific. So if you pour a little water in a big beaker, it's just going to form a puddle at the bottom. But if you pour it in something tall and narrow, it'll form a tall, narrow column, things like that. And as far as compressibility, it's pretty low to basically none, meaning Compared to gases, which is sort of the one that uh, compressibility is most important for, there's almost none for that. And then gases, of course, the intermolecular forces are very weak compared to the kinetic energy. That means the molecules, basically, there's no interaction. And they have, they move quickly in random directions. And they have an indefinite vol shape in that they will fill any complete uh, container completely. They have an indefinite volume, and they definitely are compressible. So that was most of chapter one. I don't have my book in front of me, unfortunately. Uh, the other topic, and I can't remember if it was in chapter one or chapter three, is uh, like the difference between elements, compounds, and mixtures. Is that in chapter one or three? Is it in three? It doesn't really matter which chapter I cover it in, but you know, I figure I at least try to get it close. Yeah, we went out of order on the chapters anyway. We'll just cover it in this chapter. What's the big difference between um, mixtures and uh, what do we call those? Pure substances is the term. And of course, these are all substances. And when we think pure substances, remember, we're going to divide that into elements and compounds. And when we talk about mixtures, we eventually convert those into homogeneous and hetero. So what is the big difference between a mixture and a pure substance? I tend to think of pure substances as basically chemicals because that's sort of the, the term chapter we use one. for them. OK, it's chapter one. So then we're in the right spot. So what is the big difference between mixtures and pure substances? Yeah, so these are physically separable and chemically separable. These are not physically, but they are chemically. So if we want to think about it, a mixture is simply a, you know, it's two or more substances, right? mixed in any ratio. And really, if we go forward, the only thing that's interacting between them is the intermolecular forces, right? So if I have a mixture of, of like, say, uh, copper sulfate and water, uh, the only thing that's interacting between those is the intermolecular forces that allow the copper sulfate to dissolve in the water. Whereas for pure substances and chemicals, it's, you know, it can be two or more or elements combined in a fixed ratio. So one of them has variable, one has fixed. And we technically called that, what's the word we want? Oh, definite, indefinite composition and definite composition. And what we're really saying is that in pure substances, we actually gain, lose, or share electrons. And so a mixture is pretty easy to separate because they're not chemically bonded to each other. They're just mixed in with each other. The only thing we have to think about is the intermolecular forces. Whereas a pure substance, they are. 
Homo and hetero, that one's pretty easy. That means the same. That means different. And what this really means is that you can usually see a phase boundary or a separation. And when we say same and different, we mean the same composition and properties. And then for elements and compounds, these are singular. These are two or more elements. These are technically indivisible. And when we say indivisible, we mean chemically, not nuclear chemistry. And these are chemically separable. And that's kind of how we can classify basically any sort of matter, or at least the majority of them. We also talked, and I should have mentioned it on solids, liquids, and gases. It won't be on the test, but we know there's more states than solids, liquids, and gases, right? Uh, let's see. Chapter 2. Oh, go back. Chapter 2 is an easy slash hard one, meaning we've been using it enough so that hopefully it's familiar for people. It can be a little tricky in one respect, and that's keeping track of sig figs. Chapter 2 is one of those chapters I feel is kind of like, you know, if I put on the test what's the boiling point of water, you should say... And if you can't answer that question, that should just be an auto failure after taking a chemistry class. I used to think things like that until I asked other people that I know are smart what the boiling point of water is. And when they couldn't tell me, I just groaned and realized that, no, just because I think something is something everyone should know doesn't mean anything. I'm sure Susie would tell me that I, I should know what a comma splice is, but I have no clue what that is. What is it in the Hmm? 212? I know, 212. I was going to say, I don't think most people know what the boiling point of water is in Fahrenheit either. Everyone knows that. That's because we don't encounter it on a day to day basis. Meaning, sir, we boil water, but you don't look at the weather station and see, hey, it's 212 Fahrenheit out. Yay. Crap. No, we do see the freezing point of water quite a lot, right? I think it would be kind of oh crap if it was that hot outside. I'm pretty sure that. Pretty sure at about 120, you start getting heat stroke if you're outside too much, much less throw on another 80 or 90 degrees. Ugh. Anyway, getting off topic while you guys were writing stuff down. Chapter two, two major topics, well, maybe three, but they're significant figures. So, do you guys remember sig figs? Um, what's the only tricky, tricky thing for it? Yeah, zero at the end. If there's a decimal, then it's a significant figure. If there's no decimal, it means it's not a significant figure. So if you can remember that 20.0 equals three sig figs, but that 20 equals one sig fig, that usually seems to be the one that gets people. The only other one I can remember is that sometimes gets people is zero at the front. If I write 0 0.0025, that's only two sig figs. Because we never count the zeros at the front. And so well, zero at the end, numbers, right? unless it's between two numbers. Well, I probably won't ask you what the five rules are for sig figs. I'll probably be just like on the test, which is simply how many sig figs are in these numbers. Or, yeah, and I have to admit we've gotten a little sloppy at the end of the semester, but, you know, even then we've been, I still take points off most of the time if I remember to do it. Uh, we should know scientific notation, but again, we've been using that a lot, and so, but I want to just, you know, bring it up, you know, if I have a number like that and I want to write it in scientific notation, simply move the decimal place over, one, two, three, four, five, one point zero eight times 10 to the fifth. And then if I'm going the opposite way, then this is 5.80 times 10 to the 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Wait, 1, 2, 3, 3. 
I can count, I swear to goodness. Yes, negative three. Thank you, Jess, for keeping me honest. And then, of course, the big topic, which are, you know, really, I wouldn't have to actually ask any questions specifically about significant figures in scientific notation, because every time you do a calculation, you're supposed to be keeping track of those, right? And I could simply say, you know, do the following conversions, make sure your answer has the right number of significant figures, and write it in scientific notation. And I kill all the birds with one stone. Three would be conversions. And again, this is where, you know, think about the easy ones that we did in class. Meaning, if you convert, say, inches to, you know, nanometers, meaning singular conversions, or the other one that we should remember is if we have two sets of units, you know, like if I said 70 miles per hour and I wanted to convert that to meters per second. And then the third one that was pretty common was uh, like if I wanted to convert 25 centimeters cubed to inches cubed. What's what? Nanometers. And so, you know, it's these types of questions that you should expect. I would hope that by now, at least the first one and the second one are do it in your sleep sort of things. The third one is the only one we maybe need a reminder. But, you know, if I said I have 10 inches, and I said, you know, I know one inch is 2.54 centimeters, and then I know that what, one centimeter is one times 10 to the minus two meters. And I know that um, one times 10 to the minus nine meters is one nanometer. So maybe for the metric ones, remember the one goes with whatever has the prefix. And then just look across on your chart. If I have two sets of units, it just means that, you know, I convert the first one and I say, well, I'm going to convert miles to meters. I know that one mile is, oops, I don't have this one memorized, so we go look it up, miles to kilometers. One mile is 1.609 kilometers. One kilometer is 1,000 meters. And then, you know, as a separate problem, and I'm just going to show it in a different color, but remember, we're kind of doing it at the same time. You know, I have one hour equals 60 minutes. One minute is 60 seconds. And we finish that. And I hope that, you know, I'm just writing up some little examples, mostly because I want to jog and refresh people's brains. But hopefully, by now, this is one of those things I, I hope. If I had to pick a couple topics that I wanted you to remember from chemistry forever, this sort of analysis is something I would think would be useful in a lot of other classes. And so it's one of the things I hope everyone's picked up on. And then for the cubes, we just have to remember that it means we have to do three times as much work. So if I've got 25 centimeters cubed, I would say that one centimeter is 2.5, oops, one inch is 2.54 centimeters. And that one way I can think about doing it is that I simply have to do it three times because I've got a cube in there. Or that if you're really good with your calculator, you can say 25 centimeters cubed. Well, one inch is 2.54 centimeters. And if I remember to cube that number on the top, and I cube the number on the bottom, then the units cancel out. If you want, I'll plug those into my calculator real quick so you guys can double check yourselves, or you know, we leave them maybe to your thing. And let's go and just do some little things. We'll just put a decimal in there. So what? I've got 10 times 2.54 times 1 exponent 2 negative divided by 1 exponent 9 negative. Hopefully you should get 2.5 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, I think. And 70 times 1.609 times 1,000 divided by 60 
divided by 60, I get 30, what is it, meters per second. Notice that one sig fig, so I kept one sig fig. Two sig figs, so I keep two sig figs. And then 25 divided by 2.54 cubed is 1.5 inches cubed. <coughs> On the top one, yeah. I think it should be a pretty damn big number because a nanometer is really, really tiny, and an inch is really, be really big. So there should be a lot of nanometers in an inch. So what's the negative? Is it when the decimal to the right? Yeah. Small numbers are negative. Big numbers are positive. No, Does that? Well, I know that's not exactly what you're asking. I guess what is your calculator displaying? So yeah, so I've always learned that like the right Yeah, so if you're moving the decimal to the left, that means it's positive and if you're moving the decimal to the right, that means it's negative. I always get left and right confused. Plus people get confused. What? So if I have 20,000 and I move the decimal this way, that's a positive exponent. What I'm saying is, is the other way people get it confused is if I have 2.0 times 10 to the eighth, well, okay, so this is to the left, right? I mean, okay, and 20,000 is a big number, right? That's a positive exponent, isn't it? Well, yeah, this is 2.0 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 10 minus one, two, three that's 10 four. to the 4. Okay, I'm not going to argue that point because it's a positive number, okay? That's the definition. It's kind of like, what was the other one that was a good definition? I don't remember. Anyway, the reason I don't like left and right is because when I make this number here into a real number or into a non-scientific number, I have to move it to the right. And so remembering right and left is going to get you confused, but most people can remember big and small. And so big numbers, numbers greater than one, positive exponent, small numbers, negative exponent. I think it's a better way to remember it. But you can remember left and right too. I just get lost a lot if I do that. What was the answer for Steve? 1.5 inches cubed. Okay, chapter three, if I remember right, was something that there's a lot of basically memorization to it. And so anything that you had to memorize for chapter three might show up on the test, it might not, but the major things I remember is you had to remember the states. So there's what, 11 gases, which is um, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, Chlorine plus the six noble gases. There's two liquids, which was mercury and bromine. Chlorine, chlorine, yep, bromine. And the rest are solids. There's the seven metalloids. And a certain part of me says that on the final, you really shouldn't necessarily ask any of these questions simply because you'll you'll use them somewhere else on the test, right? When you're writing a chemical reaction, you'll have to write states and various things like that. But, you know, since it was in chapter three, there might be one or two questions like that thrown in. Uh, metalloids were boron, silicon. You know, the sad part is I can't tell you unless I look on a periodic table. Germanium, arsenic, um, antimony, tellurium, and either polonium or astatine, take your pick. And the other one that's probably the most important is seven diatomics because those we do see creeping up in reactions. That's your Hofbrinkel, H2, N2, O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, 
to I2. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, I remember it based on where they are in the periodic table. I don't remember Hofbrinkle, but I think I kind of like Hofbrinkle. Uh, chapter, th and here's where I'm getting confused, meaning I don't remember if it's in chapter three or we covered it more in chapter five, but we certainly talked about metals versus non-metals. And see here where I apologize. I mean, if it ends up being in the chapter five part of the test, I guess you have to study it anyway. But I can't remember. I thought metals and non-metals was introduced in chapter three first, and then we flesh it, flesh it out or something in chapter five. What are the major differences between, oh, actually, I don't care about metals and non-metals. I want, sorry, this is Jay being silly. Um, what is the word? The two different types of bonding. Molecular and ionic. Oy, you can tell Jay's brain is fried. I'm going to blame it on Oxana's kids. They beat the crap out of me last night. This is was funny. I think I have, like, teeth mark. They bite. Especially the girl. <laughs> well, they didn't bite me after I told them not to either, but <laughs> they were vicious little bastards. Well, I guess that's mean. They're really not bastards, probably, but... We use that term in the wrong way all the time. So what's the major difference between ionic and molecular or covalent molecules? Metal, non-metal, non non-metal. Non That's kind of what I was thinking of when I was starting it off. And here, this is gain and lose electrons. This is share electrons. And while we're at it, what happens if we share equally versus unequally? Again, see, this is really chapter 10 or 11, I forget which, but, you know, it filters back, right? Meaning the question ionic and molecular covalent, I don't remember if on the final it shows up in chapter 5 or if it shows up in chapter 10 and 11 or if it shows up in chapter 6 when we're naming compounds or exactly which spot on the final it shows up, but I guarantee you there's something on it somewhere. Well, yeah, we called this polar, we call, we call this polar covalent and nonpolar covalent. This results in a dipole. This results in a nonpolar molecule. But going back to the big picture, so that's kind of off to the side, what else is the ma big differences between ionic and molecular covalent compounds? Strong attractions and weak attractions. And remember, that's a generalization. For instance, diamond is a molecular covalent compound. It has very strong attractions because of the way it's built. And that generally leads to high boiling points and melting points. These tend to be lower boiling points and melting points. What else? And I know someone else said something in the background noise, but I didn't catch it or hear it. Yep. So when dissolved in H2O means they conduct electricity. And what do we know from chapter 15? That really just means they're mostly strong electrolytes, right? Yep. And molecular covalent compounds are do not conduct electricity in water. And what that really means is that most molecular compounds are either weak electrolytes or non-electrolytes. And see, that sort of question could pop up in Chapter 15 when we talked about strong, weak, and non-electrolytes. Or that's one of those things that might bleed into whenever or wherever I ask that ionic and molecular covalent question. Uh, let's see. One other thing that I can think of off the top of my head, when we think about the structures of them, these form those big lattices, right? These tend to be singular. Meaning when I think of NaCl as kind of the iconic ionic molecule, 
it's a this big three-dimensional network and that's why it has some of the properties it has whereas if I think of water remember they're discrete little molecules that can move all over the place um, I'm getting mixed up I think this is really chapter five material more than chapter six or uh, three but did we talk about the difference between what did you say uh, we forgot to mention density in chapter one. I don't know. Atoms, cations, and anions. What's the big difference between them? These are generally neutral. Cations are. Anions are. And why are they what they are? Yeah, so positive cations lose an electron, anions gain an electron. And see, this is where I kind of get, like, for instance, what I, what I find with chemistry is that there's, a, there's certain orders that kind of make more sense than other orders to teach in material, but a lot of the topics could be shifted around in any given chemistry book to occur wherever. I think this is actually first mentioned in chapter three, if I remember your book right. And then in chapter five, we learn a lot more about what protons are, electrons are, and things like that. <coughs> so we're kind of going out of order. We're doing it more in the order we covered things in. Uh, let's see. What should we remember the major roles of protons versus electrons versus neutrons is? So protons are positive, they're found in the nucleus, and they tell us the type of element. Electrons are negative, they're found in a cloud, or at least they're found outside the nucleus, and they are responsible for all chemistry, so responsible for bonding. and therefore chemical reactions. And neutrons are found in the nucleus. They are neutral. Oops, neutral. They are responsible for half of the mass, basically, and isotopes. But really, they're unimportant. for normal chemistry, but very important for nuclear chemistry. Does that ring a bell? Or not? No, sure does. Just making okay. sure. For bonding, and therefore they're responsible for chemical reactions. take a nap. Ugh. We're only through chapter like five and we're even doing them out of order because I noticed I skipped chapter four so far. Well, isotopes have the same number of protons but have different number of neutrons. So their only difference is the mass between them. And we do chemistry and we ignore all isotopes because everything that we deal with is actually a mixture of isotopes in general and it doesn't affect the chemistry at all. The only isotope that has a serious effect on chemistry is deuterium. And deuterium is such a minor component of hydrogen that 99.9% .9 of it is straight up normal hydrogen. So that unless you use special purified forms of it, you'll never even notice the effect. Yep. So they just have different masses. That's why the masses on the periodic table are weird averages instead of nice numbers like 10, 11, 12, because they're really the random distribution of, not a random distribution, but they're based on the weighted distribution of all of the isotope weights. Uh, chapter five, we should mention scientists, of course. I know you guys love that. 
I would say as long as you know the major thing each scientist is responsible for and then maybe one or two extra things about the ones that are majorly important, then we're pretty good. Meaning, yeah, basically Rutherford and Thompson are the two big ones in this chapter that uh, they kind of made big advances towards things. Um, no, it could be any of them because I randomly pick scientists. So one of the Jay's secret test methods is he simply either has an Excel spreadsheet with, say, 20 questions on it and he randomly sorts them and picks the top three questions so that it's totally random what's on there. Or sometimes he just takes a 20-sided die or an 8-sided die, depending upon how many questions there are from his D&D &D days, and rolls the dice and picks that question. So. One of the things that I like, that I'm a big believer in, is randomization. Meaning, you know, if I have to ask a question about scientists, probably I'll ask at least one point, pointed question, meaning more details about either Rutherford or Thompson. But then all the rest of the scientists, I don't really care which one I ask a question about. So we can go back to the beginning, Democritus and Empedocles. What do you guys remember about them? Yeah, so here this guy is the elements, and maybe I shouldn't write elements because that has a different meaning for us, but he was the water, earth, etc. And Democritus was the guy that talked about atomos, meaning he's the first guy that sort of said, well, no, everything's made up of particles and not these strange elements. Uh, let's see, if we're kind of going forward in time, and I might get the order wrong, uh, I know definitely we have, well, yeah, I guess we'll mention them all. Aristotle, and why is he important? Yeah, because he's a badass philosopher, but a horrible chemist. Meaning that he threw his weight behind this Empedocles guy, and so, you know, Demot. Democritus. I, I'm not saying that because he believed the Empedocles and he formulated that and said, I believe in that, that all science stopped for hundreds and thousands of years, but it certainly probably didn't help. I mean, it'd be like, you know, if you said, okay, Jay, I'm trying to think of something where I should know a lot more about something than someone else. Um, well, it'd be like if you went and asked, say, Mark Patterson, who's in charge of the dental hygiene program, how do you give this shot? And you say, Jay, how do you give this shot? Who are you going to believe more? I hope you believe Mark more than me, because I have no freaking clue how to give shots in someone's mouth. Although, our, you know, I, I do actually, yeah, I almost said it, but I do listen to the kids talk a lot, so I might have a chance of giving some of them right, but probably not. So trust Mark, right? But... If you wanted to know how to round a number, who should you trust, Jay or Mark? Jay, because I'm. <laughs> trust me, you should trust Jay on this one. I think he knows how to round a number. Yeah, you should pick something like a little bit more difficult than that. Like, this is a real life example. Oh, okay. Yes, it's a real life example. Anyway. Uh, Let's see, who else do we have? And I know I spelled Aristotle way wrong. Uh, let's see, we have Boyle. Boyle was gas laws, right? He's also, was he the one that had flood jugs? Nah, I won't even say it. But it's not on the test. Logisan isn't even there. Yes, I won't ask a question. Well, maybe I will just now, just because. Priestley, and then we have Lavoisier. And Lavoisier is the one that I remember as conservation of mass. Yeah, elements versus compounds. But And see, I won't ask Boyle because technically we always skip chapter 12 on gas laws where he's a big dude. And so one of the reasons I even mention him back in chapter 5 is I always tell myself, yeah, we'll go extra fast this year and we'll actually cover chapter 12 like we're supposed to. And then every year I decide, no, I've tortured the kids enough. We won't do chapter 12. Hmm? 
I'm nice. Sometimes. Not very often, but occasionally. Uh, Priestley was 0-2. Well, I thought he had he might have been the phlogiston guy. He might have been the phlogiston guy then. Maybe Boyle was the one that was... Oh, Boyle was the guy that wanted them to not outlaw turning lead into gold, if I remember right. Meaning... He, th he believed that you could actually turn lead into gold, which, you know, is technically true if you have a nuclear reactor and a lot of spare time and stuff, but not terribly economic at that point. Uh, let's see. Faraday and Arrhenius. And I don't care if you mix up which one is which. They both are basically responsible or cations and anions or basically saying that matter is composed of things that are positive and things that are negative. Let's see, now I'm having to get my order right. Let's see, we have, I don't remember, is Thompson next or Goldstein? Actually, let's say Thompson for last. Goldstein was Thompson's boss. He's responsible for protons. Oh, wait. Proust, eh, we don't care about him. Um, let's see, one other guy we remembered is Dalton. And he's responsible for the six laws. Depending upon the book, that number changes. Six laws of what? Six laws of matter, basically. He's, yeah, he had the first kind of comprehensive theory of a lot of things and took a lot of rules. Yeah. He, I mean, he did some of this stuff on his own, but mostly it was borrowing stuff from other people and saying, hey, this guy says this, this guy says this, if we combine the two together, and this guy says this, and we can kind of come up with a nice, neat little theory that is mostly right. The only thing he really got wrong was anything dealing with uh, neutrons, and they weren't discovered for like, what was what? Goldstein discovered protons. Um, Thompson is the one that characterized them. Basically, Goldstein is the boss. He gets credited with the discovery. And, you know, if you really read up on it, he is the guy that really discovered it. And then he just said, well, these, look at this. And the, um, you remember the cathode ray tubes? He said, hey, look, something's coming out the back end. It's protons. And then said, Thompson, go figure out all the rest of the details. It's kind of how real life works most of the time. Chadwick was neutrons. No, that's what I mean by think broad. Think one major thing for each person, except for Thompson and uh, Rutherford. Rutherford. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember. Who's the guy that came up with the idea of an electron first? Yeah, he probably won't be on the test. No, like this guy actually like literally just said, hey, we know something negative exists. I'm going to call it an electron and talk about it a little bit, but, you know, I can't prove that it exists. Um, let's go with Thompson. Responsible for two major things, discovered electrons in a cathode ray tube. And he was sort of the first person to come up with a model for the atom. That was the plum pudding model. Yeah, Stony. He's also a famous, or he's also one of those, one of the first people are, that advo really advocated the whole idea of a metric system and having a standard set of units that all scientists used. So it's kind of important for that too. Plum pudding model, remember, is you've got positive spread out. You've got little electrons like chocolate chips. Because we also said that instead of plum pudding, we should call this the chocolate chip model. Yeah, I don't, every time I think plum pudding model, what is it? I'm like, I don't know. Plum pudding has okay. That's why I said think chocolate chips. Okay, what does that say? Spread out. Well, it, the problem is if I start writing on the edge here, 
it gets a little tough sometimes. But what he said is that the positive charge is spread everywhere, right? And the electrons are like little embedded chocolate chips. And that's why you, when you know, he applied a charge, or when he did the cathode ray experiments, the electrons are really easy to pluck out because you can think about how it would be fairly easy to take the chocolate chips out of a chocolate chip cookie. And then of course we've got the man, Rutherford, basically um, protons and neutrons. Well, he didn't know about neutrons technically, so we'll just say this. Protons equal the nucleus. It's small, dense. The electrons are in a large cloud. And that basically most of the atom is empty space. And so his picture of the atom looked like this, where he's got the positive charge in the nucleus, and the negative charge is kind of spread everywhere. So honestly, it was kind of the opposite of the plum pudding model. And let's see. I think that's it for chapter five. We are cruising along. I'm trying to give highlights only. We'll maybe go for like say 10 more minutes and call it quits. Or I can keep going till 9.30, I don't really care. I figure, let's do one last thing. This is something I recommend everyone practice. Chapter six is about naming. And I gotta be honest, most of the stuff, like for instance, I consider the chapter one stuff, the chapter three stuff, the chapter five stuff, that's mostly kind of memorization and being familiar with all the terms to answer a question. Chapter two is definitely a doable thing, meaning practice makes perfect to do conversion problems. But we've been doing those so long, I think that we don't have to worry about it. But naming is one of those things we learned in chapter six. We use a lot in a lot of the other chapters. We ca constantly talk about the name of compounds, but you're never just said, here, name these compounds. And so chapter six on the, on the uh, exam is literally just name these 10 molecules and write the formula for these 10 molecules. So, and you've got an unlimited amount of practice almost on the website. So go ahead and practice that to make sure, because it's one of those things where it's very easy to get them all right. It's also very easy to get them all wrong if you get confused. And this is one of those things that I think you need to at least practice a little bit over the next couple days to do well on the test for it. So we said that there's four types of compounds to name. We've got ionic, fixed. We've got ionic, and we called it variable, molecular, and then acids. What is the difference between ionic and molecular? So ionic is non-metal, or metal non-metal, I'm sorry. And molecular are non-metal, non-metal. And acids, of course, start with H. And what's the difference between when we say fixed and variable? Yeah, so here there's a list on the cheat sheet. And for fixed, it's basically also, it's everything else. But really, all of these are on the cheat sheet too. So it's mostly a question of paying attention and using that cheat sheet to, name, to figure out all those parts. And then what's the difference when we're naming something that's ionic and fixed versus ionic and variable? Yeah. So the big difference between ionic fixed and ionic variable is whether you have to figure out the charge on the cation, right? Meaning you name a cation and then this charge was in Roman numerals, you know, one, two, three, four, etc. Does this ring in bells? Okay. And then what do we remember for, for molecular? 
Yeah, that's the mono, di, etc. Cation, and then mono, di, etc. Anion. And remember, we don't use mono for the first one. And then the ion, anion still gets that IDE. And then, of course, acids you should just memorize. We said that you only need to know the name of 10 of them. And the trick there is that you can look on your cheat sheet for most of them, right? So let's give you a little quiz. You want me to go back? Where's Jay Bradley Jr.? Did they have to travel right off the bat or what? Yeah, I didn't think so. You know, I some some days I feel sorry for uh, athletics because I know they have to travel a lot and it's tough. And sometimes I don't because I also look at what they do with the rest of their free time and just, you know. But it really does suck, for instance, when you go away for literally a two or three week span. I mean, I don't know. How many of you guys think you could miss three weeks of chemistry? It's you miss two days and it's really yeah, I know. Catch up. I know. And I'm not saying that well, chemistry or like math. Yeah, well, I don't know how long you were technically gone for since I think even after you came back, you were a little loopy. I'm not sure you're back up to speed yet. It's strange to think about that because, I mean, you look normal and then you just realize that, well, she got hit in the head and well, just isn't quite there. Talking like nonsense of things that didn't relate to the like, conversations we were having. I don't remember. Really nice. So let's look at a quiz. What if I have Hopefully these are enough to get your brain jogged. That's kind of what we're trying to do with the review. Obviously, I don't have time to teach eight chapters worth of material or anything like that. So we're trying to get as much covered as we can, the basics, and then go and practice it a little bit. And what I would say is, you know, I'll set up, like I said, sometime Saturday and Sunday and stuff. Um, come in and get things straightened out that seem mixed up in your head. Like if you go and practice the naming, remember there's like four extra naming sheets you can even print off, right? And if you practice those and you're getting 50%, then say, okay, I better come get my brain straightened out. You practice it and you get 90%, you should be like, yeah, that's probably good enough. So all of these are ionic because they all have metals. And then what's the difference between the four? Some of them are fixed and some are variable, right? Which ones are fixed and which ones are variable? Variable, fixed, fixed, variable. And so I got to be honest, I'm going to be lazy and I'm going to pick the nice easy ones. This is just barium chloride. And this is just aluminum carbonate. Meaning, why do the hard ones first, right? So remember, one of the things I said on the test is don't go and just name them all in order necessarily because that makes your brain think about four different sets of rules, right? Go and pick all of one type to name. Go find the acid first. Go name the molecular ones second. Go name the ionic fixed ones third and save the hard ones, which is the variable ones, to last. And even the variable ones aren't too bad. It's just that, you know, because you can actually do most of the name really easily, right? meaning it's easy to fill in these parts. The hard part is that you have to remember that if chlorine is, say, a minus 1, then iron has to be a plus 3 so that we have 3 negatives and 3 positives. So that's iron 3 chloride.
Right. So why are you saying, so which one would be an example of one that's hard? But can I finish this example first? So for the vanadium phosphate, we know phosphate is minus 3. So that means I got minus 6, and I have to have plus 6. So each vanadium has to be plus 2. Now, are you saying one where you simply can't cross multiply? OK, so she's saying that there's some that you can't cross multiply from. Mostly, like a lot of people will say, OK, if that's that, then this has to be this. And that works a lot of the time, right? That'll probably get you 75% of the answers. What she's saying is that if I have something like, say, um, SbO2, well, if this is a minus 2, if I cross multiply, then that should be a 2, right? But it's not. It needs to be a plus 4 because what we have to realize is that we're really looking like this, minus 4 and plus 4. And so this would be antimony 4 oxide. And the reason why cross multiplying works is that for most numbers, the least common multiple is only f determined one way. For instance, 6 is either 2 and 3 or 1 and 6, right? And 1 and 6 is pretty easy to tell. But say like 4, that can be 1 and 4 like this example, or it can be 2 and 2 if you thought about the cross multiplying. And so the reason the cross multiplying work method kind of works is simply because most small numbers have very few um, factors, whereas I think that's the only case that tends to confuse people, which is why if you decide to cross multiply in the test, you'll probably get 8 out of 10 right, or at least you know, 80% of the time or 70% of the time right. And so you can remember the cross multiply method. It's quick, dirty, easy. But the better method is remember to multiply things out and do the charges that way. Yeah, we're doing them all. What if I do So I tried to make the first three look a lot alike, and the next two look pretty close to alike. Here we have to recognize that it's an acid, so you should just memorize that that's sulfuric. For sodium sulfate, you should recognize that it's a fixed, and so you don't need charges. For the vanadium one, though, you have to realize that it's variable, so we have to say that it's specifically vanadium plus 2. And here this is molecular, so it's sulfur trioxide and then disulfur trioxide. So notice that there's no mono if it's just sulfur on the first one. But if I have, for instance, say S3O, that would be trisulfur monoxide. Well, if I have SO3 2 minus, this is the sulfite anion. So a good point to bring up. Pay attention to whether it's got a charge or not, right? If it's got a charge, it's on that polyatomic sheet. If it doesn't have a charge, then it really is a molecular compound. And what it means is that SO3 exists by itself, right? But the sulfite anion doesn't. It has to be paired up with something that gave it those two extra electrons. What is what for? Well, this is a polyatomic ion, meaning it's got that minus 2 there. And so we name it, or we look on the polyatomic anion chart to figure out its name. And then SO3, because it has no charge, really means it's a molecular compound, so it's sulfur trioxide.
Yeah, monoxide. I got an extra O in there. Okay, now that's going from the formulas to the names. So you have to figure out the charges of the metal cations, right? What if I go from a name to a formula, like, for instance, um, What do I have to remember when doing names to compounds? Yeah, so barium carbonate is BaCO3. And then the last part is you have to say minus 2 plus 2 balanced, so I'm good. And actually, maybe I'll even write that in another color, because we don't really consider those parts of the formula. And then for arsenic-4 car uh, uh, carbonate, you would say it's As plus 4 CO3 minus 2. And then you would say, ah, I need to have two CO3 minuses to, to get that to work out. So you have to remember to always balance charges. And hopefully, you guys have been writing compounds enough. And especially in chapter 8, you had to balance charges over and over and over again that going from a name to a compound will be kind of second nature simply because you've balanced so many charges on them that it's second nature. And really, for me, the naming where I think people forget things maybe is when they're having to name those variable charges and figure out the charge on the cation. Because, you know, if I just write VO3, well, you're like, oh, that's vanadium oxide, right? And you don't think, well, there's lots of different VO3s, meaning I can have VO3, I can have V2O3, I can have V3O2, and I can't quite do that one. I could have this, you know, where this is vanadium 6 oxide, vanadium 3 oxide, and vanadium one oxide. And we forget when we just see the formula that we should throw the number in there because, well, when you look at the answer, you already know the answer to a certain extent. Meaning, if I just said vanadium oxide and you had whichever one of those three formulas, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I can see that. But you've got to remember that, you know, if I say vanadium oxide, well, you should kind of write VO down and go, well, I have no idea what the charges are. I can't balance anything. So that's a stupid question, Jay. So go practice this online. It really is the best bet for chapter six. Um, again, I can lecture and I can give you examples after examples after examples, but until you actually go and try it yourself, you won't know. So let's call it quits here. I will set up some extra study sessions on Saturday for people to ask questions and Sunday. And I don't care if you ask questions specifically on the stuff that's going to be on Monday's test or if you want to go over Lewis structures from chapter 10 and 11 then t that's technically on Tuesday's test. We'll go over those. What's a good time? I'm thinking like 6 o'clock in the morning. Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, no? I, I have enough trouble being in here. Oh, no? How about, well, wait, there's, ga there's games on Saturday. What time are the games on Saturday? At three and five then or something? Because I was going to play some racquetball, and then I was thinking we'd have the study session at four. But if that's really during the basketball games, I'll probably go to that. Yeah, but that's putting it off until like that's that's putting it off till like seven o'clock. Do you guys want to do like seven o'clock, or would you rather do say like ten o'clock in the morning? That's that's. Okay, so let's do 10 a.m. Yeah, that is that horrible. I mean, are people not going to be? Why are you going to be asleep? Well, then don't come. I'll tape them. And Sunday, what time do you guys want to pick? Would it be better to have an evening or a morning session or afternoon? I mean, I don't really care on Sunday. Because the test is right away Monday morning. Do you want to do, say, 6 o'clock on Sunday? Yeah. 
I don't think there's football games because they played last night, didn't they? Did they win or lose? They lost. So Monday is when 8 o'clock, by the way. Yes. Tuesday is the Afternoon one. It's kind of exactly like our lab times, regular time. So you shouldn't be more than a few minutes late wondering. Oh, no, I did tape it. I was like, crap. The